Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the book of Romans. We're coming to the end of uh, this great chapter, chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses 31 through 34. Paul has given us a list of great doctrines, what we've called the golden chain in the previous text, verses 29 and 30 which is God's plan of salvation from eternity to eternity. And now he draws out the implications from that. Really, I think the implications of the eighth chapter of Romans and uh, what the implication is, is we are absolutely secure. And that every believer in Jesus Christ should have the assurance of salvation. That's what he's encouraging us with here. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Let me make a comment here on this verse, verse 32, and about the identity of the all here. God gave up his son or gave over his son for us all. Well, who are these all that he speaks of? It can't be all without exception, universally. Every person who has ever lived. The, that's uh, prohibited by God's promise to give to the all for whom he gave Christ all things. All things without exception, really. Well, there is restrictions on that, but but not everything we want, but all things that are necessary, necessary for salvation, necessary for life, that would include faith. He hasn't given that to everyone, not universally. Now, what he's talking about here is all his people, all the elect. I think the context will bear that out as well. So this isn't universally the all that he's speaking of here. He's giving all God's people the encouragement that is set forth in these verses. And we'll come back to that somewhat in our reading of the passage. So who, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Faith, perseverance, glorification, everything. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is He who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of, of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank About a year ago, a sports book came out titled, How Champions Think. It's a good title for selling books, I would think. It's, and it's, in it, the author argues that champions are winners because they develop certain mental habits and attitudes. Uh, he has spent a lot of years advising some of the best players in sports. And his advice is relatively straightforward. He's op be optimistic, he said, uh, be confident and believe in your talent. Forget mistakes and failures, treat them like accidents. Commit to working hard, surround yourself with positive people. I wouldn't want to question any of that. Yogi Berra said 90% of this game is half mental. That's probably so, whatever the math. What I do know is Christians should be optimistic and have a positive attitude. We are more than conquerors, Paul will say. Romans 8 explains the reason. It's not our talents. It's not our gifts. It is God. Paul begins the chapter with the assurance there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
We are forgiven. We are declared not guilty. We are justified because of Christ's sacrifice. In verses 29 through 30, Paul explains that this great blessing is the result of God's eternal plan of salvation in what's been called the golden chain. God's plan of salvation stretches from eternity to eternity. It cannot fail. Then in the remainder of the chapter, he considers the results of this great salvation. We are safe and secure. God is for us. That's the assurance that Paul gives in verses 31 through 34. He begins his examination of our standing and situation with a question. What then shall we say to these things? What should our response be to God's eternal love for us? The we, of course, restricts the response to believers. It is not the, the general we of mankind. The, the, un, the unsaved person doesn't consider the blessings that have been outlined in chapter 8. Don't consider the great doctrines that have been set forth in the previous two verses in the golden chain and rejoice in it. They consider it all as foolishness. So this question here doesn't apply to them. But we who have tasted them, he's asking, what are we to say to them? And Paul's answer to his question is another question. It's as though he says, let me get more specific about this. If God is for us, who is against us? Who is against us? Well, we might answer that. People, circumstances, things are against us, and many. The, the passage itself gives a sense of that. Uh, Romans 8 has the atmosphere of a courtroom where we're on trial and we're surrounded by adversaries and witnesses for the prosecution. They all try to condemn us and undermine us, the world and the flesh and the devil. These are our great adversaries, our great enemies. Jesus warned Peter, Satan would sift him like wheat. Peter said, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Paul wrote of the devil's fiery darts in Ephesians 6. So we have enemies, strong ones. But Paul's question, if God is for us, is really a rhetorical question. It actually means, since God is for us, those enemies don't matter. They cannot prevail against us. How could they? He is the Almighty. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. No one can stand against Him. He sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, Isaiah says. In fact, as Paul has already stated in verse 28, God even uses our enemies and the calamities of life to become a blessing for us. He makes them work for our greater and ultimate benefit and good. But if God could possibly stop being for us, is that a, the case? What, what if that were so? What, what if His attitude, for example, should change toward us? Now, that's a fair question. Because friends change their attitudes toward us. And we, we certainly give God reason to change toward us. So what if he does that? What if we mess up and his patience runs out and we end up being condemned and overwhelmed? I think that's the kind of concern that, that people have. I'm sure Paul face that with some individuals in the church. I've come across that. You have too, no doubt. So Paul answers it and, and, and all doubts in verse 32 by showing that God's love toward us could never fail. 
And the first proof of that is what God has already done for us. He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? The conclusive proof of God's love for us, and that His love for us can never fail, is the cross. It is the sacrifice that He's already made for us. He has given for us His own Son. There's no greater assurance of His love than that. All of us for whom Christ died, for whom God delivered Him over, will receive every blessing from God. Now again, he's speaking of believers here. The, that, that's clear from the context. They are those who love God in verse 28, those who are foreknown or foreloved and predestined in verse 29. It is we, those to whom he's writing this book, and, and more broadly than that, all of us who believe these things in verse 31, the we. And it's the elect of verse 33. That's the context. That's who he's addressing here. But Paul is saying that if God loved us enough to give His Son for us, and He did, that's not in question, then He will certainly love us enough to give us all blessings. And He will do that for us all, for every believer. And I, I would interject this in regard to that word all. It's all God's people. It's God, all God's elect. And I, I suspect that there is this notion within it that some might think, well, I know he loves him, or I know the Lord loves her. She's so obedient and righteous, but I fail all the time. Maybe he doesn't love me, and maybe I don't have the assurance that they have good reason for having. And Paul's addressing this. He no, all of God's people, all of the elect have this assurance that He is constant toward them and will never fail. And we have various reasons for that, not only from this chapter, not only from the immediate verses that we've studied, and the entire, the, but the entire chapter and the whole book. Go back to chapter 5 and verse 8. When did God give up His Son for us? When did he do that? Well, Paul said it was while we were yet sinners. That is how God demonstrated his own love toward us. Now, if he loved us when we were sinners, if he loved us, that is, when we were separated from him in rebellion against him, if he loved us when we were enemies, won't he continue to love us now that we are his friends, now that we are his children? Of course he will. And He will give us everything we need to prosper. The cross is the demonstration of that. It is the proof of God's unconditional and unfailing love for us. The British Baptist Octavius Winslow asked, Who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money. Not Pilate for fear. Not the Jews for envy but the Father for love. In fact, Paul emphasizes the Father's love in the sacrifice of Christ by, by stating it both positively and negatively. Not only did He deliver Him up, deliver Him over, He also did not spare Him. That, that's similar to God's statement to Abraham back in Genesis 22, verse 12, when Abraham showed himself willing to offer up Isaac on Mount Moriah. The knife was raised. Everything was poised to happen. And in fact, I, in my mind, think, and I think this is correct, that it was when Abraham was, had will to do this, he was at the moment of bringing the knife down fatally upon his son Isaac that God stopped him. The Lord recognized that he had not withheld his son from him. But while the Lord spared Abraham's son, 
He did not spare His own Son. He could have. Christ did not deserve to die. In fact, Christ is the only one of all humanity that deserved to be spared. But the Father did not because He loved us. And we could not be saved in any other way than by His Son being offered up for us. Now that preposition for can mean for our benefit, but I think it has more the meaning of in our place because it also means that. And that's what the context supports that. This, this indicates substitution. The Father put His Son in our place in judgment. He, the Son, bore our sins in our place, and in doing so bore our penalty in our place. Every spring the Jews celebrate Passover. At the first Passover in Egypt, a lamb was slain in the place of the firstborn in all of the Israelite households, so that the firstborn would be spared. And then the blood was smeared on the door of the house to prove that the substitute had been sacrificed for that firstborn child. Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. He wasn't spared. He is our Passover. He is our substitute. He died so that we might not die eternally and that we would have His life forever. God is the judge of all the earth. That's what Abraham said. But there's no greater proof that He will never stop loving us and never start condemning us than this, that He spared not His own Son for us. Well, still, someone might worry because our needs are so great. And they are, and they are constant, and they are really beyond our ability to count. They're constant. We are always in need. And we need not only many things, but we need great things. They're very demanding, our needs. Well, Paul promises that God will give us all things. All things. Now, is that absolute? Or are there limits to God's grace? How can we be sure that God will supply all our needs? And again, the con conclusive proof is the gift that He has already given to us, His own Son. There's no greater gift than that. God could not give a greater gift to us than that gift which He gave His only begotten Son as a sacrifice for us. Now, the logic of this is, if He gave the greatest gift for us, and gave it to us, remember, when we were enemies, when we were sinners. Well, if He gave the greatest gift, will He not give us the lesser gift? Because every gift that He gives us is certainly less than the one great gift that He gave us. That's the logic of Paul's statement. Of course, there's nothing that He will withhold from us. The cross is the guarantee of the continuing, unfailing generosity of God. And we see His help in a number of ways. He will strengthen us in times of temptation. He will give uh, companionship in times of loneliness. And sometimes that gift of companionship is His own special presence. Uh, Paul was alone in Rome when he stood trial before Nero. He wrote to Timothy about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, and he said, No one supported me. All deserted me. Paul's friends there in Rome became frightened, and they did not stand with Paul. He was alone at that great trial before the emperor. But he added, The Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that he was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will never leave us or forsake us. Psalm 27.10, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. He will be a father to the fatherless and a judge to the widow. Psalm 68 verse 5. He, he promises to give us wisdom and direction in life and to meet our material needs as well. 
That's what Paul told the, the Philippians in Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And Paul says that here. He will freely give us all things. Now, once again, the word all needs to be qualified. When he says all things, he doesn't mean all things without exception. He's not going to give us all the things that we want, all the things we desire, because we don't know what to want. We don't know how to pray as we ought, he's told us. We don't know how to seek things as we should. And there are things, no doubt, as you look at your life that you wanted at one point that now you realize it's good that I didn't get that. It's good I didn't go in that direction. I thought it was the right thing. I sure wanted this or that, and I didn't receive them. Well, God's not going to give us the things that aren't helpful to us. He's not going to give us our every wish. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul told the Philippians, He will supply your needs, the things that are best for you. That's the all things. The all things that are for our good. We can thank Him for that. Material riches are, are seldom for our spiritual good. And He may deprive us of those for a time so that we will look to Him and we'll learn to trust in Him and we'll see His hand of provision. But everything that we need and is for our good, He will give us. God will not withhold the best from those He loves. So, what shall we say to these things? What should our response and attitude be? Well, it should be one of thanksgiving, one of joy and confidence, regardless of the circumstance we may find ourselves in. We are secure. And Paul adds more comfort and encouragement in the next verses with the rhetorical question, who can accuse us and who can condemn us? And we're back in the courtroom where the accusations are made and judgment pronounced. And again, the, the question here in verse 33 who will bring a charge against God's elect, could be answered, many do. There are people all around us who, when they see us fail, as we do, point an accusing finger. The world is quick to point out inconsistencies in Christian behavior. And there are plenty of those. Whether people around us see them or not, we see them. We sin daily. We fail daily. If not publicly, then privately in our homes or in our thoughts. And if people aren't out there accusing us, our consciences accuse us, as does the devil. John writes in Revelation 12.10 that he accuses the brethren before God day and night. In fact, the word devil means slanderer, and the name Satan means accuser. That's what he does. He, 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 he slanders the saints. He accuses us. So God hears charges against us continually. He hears how we are unworthy of our calling, how we don't measure up to the word saint, sanctified one. They're not sanctified. Look at them. Look at him. He's an embarrassment. Those are the accusations that the devil brings against us. And of course, God isn't learning anything from the devil. He's omniscient. He knows all. He knew all of our failures before we ever committed them. He's known all of our failures from all eternity when He chose us in eternity past. So there are many who, who accuse us. We could answer that way, and Paul certainly knew that very well, but their accusations cannot stand against us any more than our enemies can prevail against us. That's Paul's point. After all, he began the chapter, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And that's Paul's meaning here. God is the one who justifies. That settles the issue. Because the judge of all the earth 
in the supreme court of the universe has declared his people right with him. He has justified us. He's not just forgiven us of our sins. Justification means more than that. He has ruled that we are righteous in his sight. Forgiveness is the negative aspect. We're forgiven of that, but we are also positively righteous in his sight. We are no longer guilty and liable to the penalty of the law. Not, not simply because we are elect. Election doesn't save. Election is unto salvation. And salvation is only through Christ's sacrifice. It is Christ who saves because his death is the lawful payment of all the sins of all who believe in him. So, when a person believes, the Lord's death and payment become the believer's possession. His death is my death. His payment, my payment. Done in my place for me. And at that moment, he or she, whoever is the believer, is justified. God imputes the innocence and righteousness of Christ to the believer, just as he imputed the sins and guilt of the believer to Christ. It is what has been called the sweet exchange. My sins to Christ, his righteousness to me. As a result of it, the, the believer is considered by God to be just like Christ. And no charge or accusation can stand against him or her. I think the great biblical example of this, and one that I, I think I probably cite frequently, is that that's found in Zechariah chapter 3, where the high priest Joshua is standing in the temple before God, and Satan is there accusing him. Joshua is clothed in filthy garments uh, from head to toe. His clothes are dirty. And it's a picture of his guilt. And Satan is arguing that he's a sinner. He's unfit to be a servant of God. How can this man be a priest? Look at him. But God answers the accusations by silencing Satan and ordering Joshua's clothes to be changed. His filthy garments are replaced with clean clothes. And God declares him to be a brand plucked from the fire. Now that's what, that's what all of us are. Sinners saved by grace and declared righteous by God, clothed in Christ. And since it is God who justifies, our justification can never be overturned. That means we can never be judged. We are absolutely secure. That's the meaning of Paul's next question in verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? No one. Because of Christ, his death was a complete and final payment for sin. It satisfied God's justice. There is nothing left to condemn in those for whom Christ died. He paid the penalty in full. So we who have believed in him, we who have laid hold of the cross by faith, have nothing to fear. We are forever safe. That is the assurance Paul is giving in the words, Christ Jesus is he who died. He paid it all when he died. There is nothing more to do. There's nothing unfinished in the work that Christ declared to be finished on the cross. Well, how do we know that? These are very encouraging statements, very significant statements. We're absolutely secure. We have that assurance. But how do we know this? How do we know that his death really succeeded in gaining for us all of the blessings that Paul is speaking of here? How do we know God accepted his son's payment for our sins? And here we come to the, the key point in the lesson. The only way we can know that the sacrifice of Christ was successful and that all of these blessings are ours is the resurrection. His death would have been in vain if he had remained in the grave. 
But the resurrection is the proof that God the Father accepted his sacrifice for us all. It's the receipt of payment, so to speak. The evidence that our bill has been paid in full. And Paul stresses that here by saying it was Christ Jesus who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Which is a way of saying the resurrection is the necessary conclusion to the cross. If Christ had not been raised, we would not have assurance of salvation. Really what we would have is the assurance that we are lost. It is as the living Lord that He ensures our blessing and security. People often make the mistake that the cross was a defeat and the resurrection the victory. The cross was the victory. The resurrection is the endorsement of the victory. It is the proclamation and the demonstration that Christ defeated death on the cross and crushed all His enemies, all evil powers. He paid for all of our sins. He has removed our guilt from us. And the resurrection is the proof of that. That's how we know He succeeded. That's how we, we, we know that we are, are safe forever. God raised His Son from the dead as the demonstration of that. We have a living Savior. That's the evidence, the proof that God accepted His Son's sacrifice for us. And because He is alive, He is presently working on our behalf. Paul says He is at the right hand of God, alive, glorified in heaven, so when Satan accuses us before the throne of God, Jesus stands and silences him. The Father can point to the Son. All of those sins have been paid for in my Son. His presence there, alive and glorified, is the very proof of that, that all of our sins are forgiven forever. When our conscience accuses us and tells us that we couldn't be saved, not after we've done that. we failed yet again. Sinned yet again. When that happens, remember, Christ is seated in heaven at the Father's right hand. He is alive. God has accepted His Son's sacrifice for us, for all our sins. All have been paid for in full. As a result, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The living Savior defends us. And He is in a good place to do that. He is, as Paul says, at the right hand of God. It is the place of honor. It's the place of privilege. It's the place of power and dominion over the whole creation. He has authority over heaven and earth. There is no hostile power, no catastrophic circumstance in the universe that can overpower Him and snatch us from His hand. He's supreme. And having died for us, He will certainly live for us and keep us. He does that by His power and by His prayer. He is presently praying for us. Paul writes that He also intercedes for us. That's His priestly service. He is both an enthroned king and a seated priest. Now that's very significant. Because in the Old Testament, the priest never sat down during his service. Priests always stood. There was no place for them to sit. Uh, it, the tabernacle had furniture. There was a table. There was a lampstand. There was the Ark of the Covenant. But there's no chair. There's no place for the priest to sit down, and that was deliberate. It's because the priest's work was never finished. The great day of atonement and, and the offering of the sacrifices had to be repeated every year. It was never finished. But Christ is a different priest of a different order. He made the final sacrifice. And when He ascended to heaven, we read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, He sat down 
at the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down because the work is finished. Now he sat down, but he is not inactive. He is a, a seated priest because there are no more sacrifices to make, no more sacrifices to be offered. The final one has been made. It's complete. But he is still active in offering prayers for us and doing so continually. That is his continuing high priestly ministry. He intercedes for us. And that is a further guarantee of the believer's security. Not only what God has done, but what Christ is presently doing. He is praying for our every need. Praying that all of the blessings of His death be applied to us and grace will be given to enable us to continue in the faith and to live the Christian life. He is constantly making these prayers and assuring us that all the blessings of the, Christ, the cross are ours, are applied to us continually. The Lord, the Lord is not interested in us only in a very general way but in a very specific, personal way. He prays for us individually, just as He died for us all individually. He knows our particular situations in life, the, the, the special circumstances and difficulties that we have, and He prays for them. He is intimately involved in our lives, ensuring that we triumph that we persevere to the end. And we, we are blessed through all of the events of life. Nothing is left to chance. God's plan of salvation is from eternity to eternity. He chose a multitude to be glorified and gave His Son to save them. And Christ is presently praying for us. He's praying for us right now. He, he knows the struggle that you are having right now at this moment. The struggle that, that so troubles you. He knows what's coming. And you don't know what's coming. And He's praying about that. He's preparing you for that. Believers in Jesus Christ are absolutely secure in Him. So Paul asks, what then shall we say to these things? What, what is to be our response to these promises and this assurance? We're to believe them and rest in them, rejoice in them, and thank God for them. When we get down, we are to remember them and take comfort in them. We have a living Savior. That's assurance. Though it is for believers alone. It is for the us of verse 31. It is for the elect of verse 33. It is for those who love Him. If you've not trusted in Christ, these promises are not yours. Not yet. But they can be through faith alone. The elect are chosen for salvation through faith. The elect believe. So, if you've not believed, discover that you are elect by believing in Jesus Christ. He's God's eternal Son who took on flesh, became a genuine man with a true body and a reasonable soul in order to die in our place. And all who believe in Him are saved, forgiven, and safe forever. So come to Christ and you who have rejoice in who you are and where you are, secure in the Savior. That's reason to be thankful, that's reason to give praise. Let's bow in a word of prayer and give thanks for that. Father, we do thank You for Your grace and Your plan of salvation which originated in eternity past, which is to say it had no origination in time. It is an eternal plan. It has existed in your mind as long as you've existed, which is forever. And you executed it in this moment called time, in the death 
and the sacrifice of your Son, and then through the work of the Holy Spirit, which has brought us who are believers to a saving knowledge of Christ and placed us in Him where we are absolutely secure. We are in His hand, and He is in your hand, and no one can pluck us out of His hand. What a great truth that is. And what an incentive to live a righteous life that you have done all of that for us. We should do what we can for you. And we will by your grace. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.